Welcome back, everybody. We are into our next round of invited keynote presentations. I am Robin Milden, the Executive Director for the Centre for Evidence and Implementation, one of the co-hosts of this event, along with our partners at Monash University. I um, now have the pleasure of uh, continuing to welcome those of you that have been with us all day and possibly welcoming, welcoming people from Europe and the UK, depending on, in the UK, how early you wanted to get up. But if you are joining us for the first time, good morning and nice to see you. And for everybody else that's been with us all day, what a terrific day we've had so far. So I have the great pleasure of introducing our next keynote, Professor John Thwaites from Monash University. He is the former Deputy Premier of Victoria from 1999 to 2002, the state that both John and I are coming to you from um, today. He is also the chair of the National Sustainable Development Council and developed the Transforming Australia Sustainable Development Goals Progress Report 2018. He is a co-chair of the Leadership Council of the UN Sustainable Development Network and launched the Secretary General of the United Nations to provide expert advice and support around the development and implementation of the SDGs. I'm not going to keep reading. You can see his bio in there. He has one terrific um, background and I'm really thrilled, John, you agreed to um, give a keynote at the event. So I'll hand over to you. I will be monitoring. Please put questions in the Q&A part of your online platform as you go. I will be watching them. You can also vote for them if you, if you feel that way inclined, and that means they will pop up higher on my feed. And John, towards the end of the keynote, I will um, facilitate a conversation using your Q&A. So over to you, John, thank you. Well, thanks uh, very much, Robin, and it's great to be speaking today uh, at the uh, Evidence and Implementation Summit. I'm gonna be speaking about uh, politics and evidence and speaking truth to power, but are they listening? And I'll be using uh, both my background as a politician, but also my current role at Monash, where we do a lot of work with government and politicians. That's a slide that was shown to the cabinet when I was a minister by uh, Professor Jack Shonkoff, who was a professor of paediatrics at Harvard and a world leader on early childhood development. And when you look at that slide, which is a cross section of the brain of a baby at birth, a six year old and a 14 year old, you'll see the extraordinary development, neural development in the brain between birth and six years. And Dr. Shonkoff showed this to the cabinet and he explained that that development of the brain in the first six years sets the path for that child for the rest of their life. Now, this was interesting because it's really one of the very rare times that a academic, a, a, an expert, spoke directly to cabinet when I was a minister. And as it turned out, he spoke for more than an hour. Cabinet was fascinated. And following that, the cabinet invested hundreds of millions of dollars in early childhood development over a number of years. And it really goes back to that initial time when Dr. Shonkoff spoke to us. And I think what's important is that he not only gave us good evidence, but he also told a convincing story. Uh, another case was uh, Peter Cullen, a expert water scientist who spoke to governments all around Australia and convinced them that we needed to change the way we managed water, and particularly in the Murray-Darling Basin. And once again, he was able to give good evidence, but also tell a very convincing story. Unfortunately, I'd have to say that as health minister, I also had a lot of times where evidence and politics came into conflict. And a good example of that was when I tried to implement supervised injecting rooms uh, to reduce the risk of drug users dying, or when as climate change minister, we tried to introduce climate policy and we came up against a lot of emotional and political opposition. Now I'm at, at Monash University and chair of the Monash Sustainable Development Institute. And a lot of what we do is to try to bridge research with 
government and politics and to use our understanding of, of both to achieve uh, real impact. And we partly do that through Behaviour Works Australia, which is specialising in behavioural insights. But what I want to really say is that uh, for a politician, evidence is important, but it's not everything. And that's me as a politician, as a minister, demonstrating the first rule of uh, uh, political decision making. And that is that it has to end up in a politician wearing a hard hat and a high vis vest. But today, what I want to talk about uh, is, in summary, three things. How is evidence used by politicians? Why best evidence is not always followed? And what can be done to improve the likelihood that evidence will inform policy? I've no doubt that uh, the quality of government decision-making would improve if we and politicians did give greater credence to, to evidence and particularly research-based evidence. But while uh, um, evidence-based policy is the gold standard, politicians are driven by many factors other than evidence. And researchers and experts are going to be more likely to be able to influence politicians if they better understand those factors. Well, the first point, how is evidence uh, used by politicians? And I think it's fair to say that evidence is very much in the eye of the beholder because politicians certainly believe that they follow evidence, but there are different perceptions about what uh, that evidence is. And I think it's worth highlighting how there are so many different sources of evidence that are used in the political process. There's the more robust sources, such as academic research, grey literature, government reports, royal commissions, expert evidence, and importantly, citizens' experience. But often there's less robust uh, evidence sources, such as the politician's favourite expert, anecdotal evidence, consultants that are paid to produce reports by interested parties, the media, and of course, Google and, and Google searches. And I think it is worth really thinking about how politicians regard the most robust source of evidence, and that is peer-reviewed academic research. I think politicians first believe that academic research doesn't answer the poly policy questions that they want answers to. It's thought not to be timely. There's a huge volume. You can't find the needle for the haystack. Politicians think academics don't understand the complexities of the real world. They uh, also find, and I think there's some truth in this, that peer-reviewed research doesn't necessarily offer any consensus for policy. And finally, I think that politicians believe that they have a, a broader understanding of the impacts and interactions that govern issues, whereas specialist uh, researchers are seen as having a much narrower focus. And in some regards, I think that's uh, true. And at Monash, for example, we've helped some of our researchers in influencing the government process by taking them through virtual cabinet processes where the researchers are expected to put a submission to the cabinet and we get former politicians to be the cabinet. And I think the researchers have often been surprised by the range of issues that the politicians ask them to address, often outside their area of expertise, but very much within the range of issues that the politician has to consider. Now, on the other hand, how do academics regard politics? And you know, a simple um, graph might be this, where there's evidence and then there's politics and then a decision is made. And very often, I think academics, but stakeholders also think that politics plays much too big a role 
in decision making. And that then leads to calls for independent processes that essentially take politicians out of the decision making. And we see this in calls for independent commissions uh, that are often made for, for difficult issues. But I think that this is a vast oversimplification of what actually happens. And I think it also understates the critical role that politics has and politicians have in resolving the conflicts about values and interests that is the stuff of politics. And a good example is the Murray-Darling Basin, which, uh, as I indicated, Peter Cullen advised the governments in Australia about, which was a very disputed water issue where interests between farmers and different communities were so great that we have to have a political overlay as well as evidence. I think this is also an oversimplification because if you look at the way policy is really made, it's much more complex. And the political scientist John Kingdom describes how there are multiple streams in politics. And it's when you have a compelling problem, a viable policy option and conducive politics that you get that opportunity window there in the centre. And that's really the only time you can get change in politics or it's the usual time at least. And it's when you have those three things, the problem, the policy and the conducive politics, that evidence is so important because that's when the politicians and the government will be looking for it. And when you get those three things coming together and the opportunity window, what you don't have is a shortage of evidence. Often you have too much and you have so many players all with their own evidence that they want to bring to bear. And politicians in the system don't have much in the way of a process for processing all of those different force, um, sources of evidence and views. I do think it's worth highlighting that there are, of course, systems to do that, and one are uh, systematic reviews of research evidence. And they historically have been very prominent in health with Cochrane reviews and the like. But we're seeing systematic reviews now being used more broadly. And at Monash, in our institute, we have a whole uh, section, Social Systems Evidence, in partnership with McMaster University in Canada, which is collecting together a database of systematic reviews on the policy problems that government have across economic, social and environmental domains and linked to the sustainable development goals. But I have to say, when I was a minister, I had no knowledge of even what systematic reviews are, and I suspect most politicians don't. And just as I don't think politicians or many people in government have very sophisticated understanding of data science or modelling. So there's a lot that needs to be learnt. But I also think in this understanding of policy, it's really important to keep the citizen at the centre also and to understand that citizens and stakeholders have a lot of lived experience that needs to be fed into this complex mix. So that was how evidence is used, what about why and why best evidence uh, may not always be followed? And I, I think that's because politics and science are so different. They operate on completely different timescales. The focus is, is very different. Researchers tend to focus on one issue answering a particular question, whereas politicians have to focus on a multiple list of issues that are connected in complex ways. The research method is totally different from the political decision-making method. And there's really not a lot of understanding in uh, politics about the research method. Politics, uh, unlike research, is driven by values and emotion and interests. And the right answer in politics is not necessarily 
an objective evidence-based answer, but it's the best fit to a complex array of interests and values. And so it's very much the art of the possible. And finally, I think uh, for very good reasons, politics is about compromise. Now, often you hear criticisms of politicians and they're always compromising, but how else can we solve this conflict of values and interests in a peaceful way, which is the great achievement of uh, modern democracy without compromise? If we're also going to understand uh, why evidence is used as it is and why it's not always used as we might want it, it's necessary to really focus on the nature of modern government. What, what, what is it like? And I think the first aspect to understand is that power is very much at the top. And the way the top person, whether it's the prime minister, the president, or the premier of the state is seeing an issue or seeing evidence is going to have a huge impact on how that evidence will be treated. The next aspect is the extreme time pressure. I'm, I'm busy now at Monash, but it is nothing compared to what it was like being a health minister, being woken up at six every day with the latest crisis and you know, frankly, working all day and into the evening without a break with constant decisions to be made. And the next uh, issue I think that's really relevant is that politics is all about continuous campaigning. It's very much a partisan field where the government and opposition see every issue through the lens of the competition that they're in for political power. And it's also very much around issues that are extremely complex. We've got now very short media cycle and the media are now running campaigns rather than just reporting the news. In the last decade, we've seen the rise of social media, huge expectations of stakeholders and expectations for community engagement. And all of that has major implications for how evidence is used. The first implication is if you're a researcher or an expert, your issue is not the only issue. And that's quite hard for a lot of people who are passionate about their issue to understand. But the reality is, unless it's on what the politicians might call the grid, that is their major issues, you're probably not even going to be listened to. And the second implication is that long-term complex issues are often put in the too hard basket because politicians are so busy, there's no easy answer. And so the best thing to do is seem to be to simply deal with them later. And we had a phrase for this when I was in government, which was putting them in the taxi and sending them round the block. And that's why a lot of these complex issues around um, disadvantage, climate change, don't get dealt with. The third implication for how evidence is used is that politicians rely hugely on trusted advisors, and they may be political advisors, or they may be outside. A lot of politicians have um, you know, a kitchen cabinet to advise them on issues. And that's because those advisors are not only seen as giving good advice, but they're also seen as loyal in that very adversarial situation we're in. And then finally, uh, politicians, because they are so busy, have to rely on heuristics. That's mental uh, shortcuts for making decisions. And I'll talk a bit about that uh, later. But I did highlight those trusted advisors, and I think it's worth just focusing a bit on how the political advisors will be thinking, because they're going to be weighing up uh, for a particular issue the political benefit against the political effort and considering you know, who benefits, who loses, 
Uh, how will the stakeholders react? What are the political risks? Where does it sit on that graph? And that focus means that uh, evidence and what works in implementation may get insufficient attention. And this is why I think uh, the role of the Centre for Evidence and Implementation is so critical in making the case for implementation science as a key part of the decision-making process and the political system. And I also think it's important for political advisors and for politicians, not just for uh, the main public service. Now, I think the other big issue that we need to focus on when we're looking at evidence is emotion and the role of emotion in considering evidence. Uh, in his book, The Political Brain, the US clinical psychologist Drew Weston traces the evolution of the brain from primitive animals through to uh, humans and says, it's clear that feelings are millions of years older than the kind of conscious thought processes that we call reason. And they've been guiding behavior for far longer. And there's absolutely no doubt that emotion plays a, a really big part in how people view political uh, decisions and policies and issues. And those emotions are very much linked to our values and to our feelings. And contrary to what a lot of economists um, tell us, uh, voters are not calculating machines that weigh up what's in their best interest or uh, weigh it up according to some sort of cost benefit analysis. Rather, they're really guided in most cases by how they feel, how they feel about political parties, political leaders, and political issues, probably in that order. And also about what emotions different policies evoke in them, uh, anger, fear, pride, or compassion. And uh, Drew Weston in that book describes how we interpret information and evidence in order to make us feel emotionally comfortable. Uh, and I quote, our brains have a remarkable capacity to find their way towards convenient truths, even if they're not all true. So I think most politicians understand uh, intuitively the role of emotion in politics. And they themselves, the politicians, are very influenced by values and emotions. And that influences the way in which they consider uh, evidence. So if scientists and experts are seeking to influence the political process, they really need to take account of the potential emotional response to their evidence. And there are many instances in politics I can recall where emotion and uh, values came into conflict with scientific evidence. And the first one I touched on before, which was uh, supervised injecting facilities. When I first became health minister, we had a terrible rash of heroin deaths from overdose. More people were dying from overdose than from road accidents. And the uh, evidence was that a supervised injecting room that allowed drug users to inject under medical supervision safely would reduce deaths. But there was enormous reaction to that, negative reaction. And I think it was driven by the emotion that many people had of sort of disgust for the drug or for drugs and drug use and their fear that in doing this we'd be encouraging drug users. The next example came when I was a water minister and we we're in the middle of an extreme drought looking for ways of uh, finding uh, new sources of water and of course the use of recycled water into our water system came up and once again, around Australia at the time, during the drought, the 
uh, evidence around recycled water was completely overtaken by the emotions associated with it. And you can see there, dogs drink water from toilets, humans don't. So the yuck factor, the yuck factor emotion took over from the evidence. Third example, uh, when I was environment minister, I sought to get cattle um, out of the Alpine National Parks because of a huge amount of scientific evidence that showed that they did enormous damage to the ecosystems of the National Park. But on the top right there, you'll see the mountain cattlemen and they were able to um, evoke an emotion amongst many people in the public in support of our heritage, the man from Snowy River uh, that was being threatened by this terrible inner city proposal to get rid of cattle. Now, in that case, I was actually successful, but it was a very tough battle uh, because of the emotion. And then finally, carbon and climate as climate change minister where there was an enormous and is an enormous body of evidence that we have to take much stronger action on climate change and that a carbon price is one of the most efficient ways to do that. But the politicians uh, on the conservative side were able to frame that as a great big new carbon tax. And that spurred an emotional response from many a fear around uh, taxation. And so once again, an emotional issue really overrode uh, the evidence. Now there's lots of uh, research that shows that people interpret evidence and information based on what they see as their political identity and their political attitudes. And I'm very keen on the research of Dan Kahn, who's a professor of law and psychology at Yale. And he calls, calls this reasoning identity protective cognition, or it's called motivated reasoning. And essentially what he found in his research was that individuals with hierarchic or individualistic worldviews are much less likely to regard climate change or global warming as a risk, that's the red on the graph, than uh, individuals who are more egalitarian or more communitarian. But I think what's really also interesting about his research is that he also found that the way people interpret evidence is also very much influenced by how the evidence is presented. And what he found through his uh, experiments was that conservatives were much more likely to accept the science of climate change if you told them that the answer was nuclear power. Whereas if you told conservatives that the answer was anti-pollution regulation, they didn't believe the science. So our brains direct themselves to fit with our attitudes. And once again, I think there's a lot of lessons for that for researchers in how they present to the public, but also to politicians. And there's also an interesting question, are politicians even more biased when it comes to their attitude to evidence than the general public? And there is some research to suggest that might be true. Uh, there was a Danish study which asked local politicians uh, and a sample of the public to evaluate which provider of elderly care services was better based on user satisfaction data. And what they found was that the politicians who are opposed to privatisation interpreted the data differently than those who supported it and uh, rejected uh, pri private, uh, private service provision. But what was really interesting was that when they then, in the research experiment, sought to introduce the de debiasing intervention, that is to get the uh, politician or the member of the public to justify their evaluation. When the members of the public were asked to do that, 
they are actually more likely to come back to the real evidence. Whereas the experienced politicians double down on their views. So it is possible that the whole ethos and process of politics makes politicians even more uh, biased. And so that then leads me to turn to heuristics and the political brain. And, you know, like everyone else, politicians use heuristics or mental shortcuts to come to decisions. And uh, in 2019, BehaviourWorks facilitated a really interesting experiment and exercise involving senior politicians and bureaucrats to explore a controversial uh, um, political proposal, which was the introduction of transport network pricing. That is putting a charge for road use or public transport depending upon when the user uses it and how far they travel. And what was really interesting is that when the former politicians discussed this, they elicited some of the heuristics that they believed the public would uh, use in making decisions, but they also demonstrated the heuristics that they use in their political processes. And, uh, the first was stereotyping, where the politicians stereotyped, and that is made generalised characteristics of a group of members of the public. And in this case, it was outer suburban men, uh, might be tradies and their attitude to roads and driving and tolls. The next uh, interesting heuristic that, that politicians used was the framing effect. And, they are very aware that how an issue is presented, the framing would have a huge impact. And so if this uh, political proposal of transport network pricing was called a road toll, that has a very negative framing and was likely to lead, lead to it being rejected. They also had other uh, heuristics, the decoy effect, putting up a option, a third option, which was so bad, it, pushed or nudged people towards the better option. But the politicians themselves exhibited what is called hyperbolic discounting, that is uh, favouring short-term political gain over long-term bigger gains. Uh, and essentially, in this case, it was around the politicians really came up with short-term, relatively small initiatives rather than risk uh, the political downside of very large initiatives that might have bigger long-term gains. We also saw the politicians say that we should wait and see, which in politics is sometimes quite a smart heuristic to use. And finally, the availability heuristic, which is all about politicians assessing something based on how easy it is for them to recall something in their experience which had similar occurrences and then tend to rely on that rather than the evidence. So it was a really interesting process. And the conclusion that some of the researchers actually came to was, yes, evidence wasn't always used by the politicians, but their understanding of the heuristics of the public was such that it helped them navigate what was a tricky political issue. Now, finally, I turn to uh, what can be done uh, to increase the likelihood of evidence-based policy. And firstly, I want to look at what you as researchers and uh, experts can do to influence government. And there are 10 commandments of influencing government that I use, and I'll quickly like to go through them. The first is know what you want to achieve. It's so common that experts cannot translate their research into something that government can do. And second is know what the government wants to achieve. And once again, if you don't know what the government wants to achieve, what their priority is, you're unlikely to influence government. Third, understand who the decision maker is and what their priorities are. And fourth, come up with a solution, not a problem. And that's what Peter Cullen did 
with the Murray-Darling Basin Plan and the National Water Initiative, he was able to give government a solution which was around helping the environment and helping farmers, which they could then adopt. Collaborate, come as a team, as Peter Cullen did, with some farmers and some environmentalists. But also it might be at times try to come up with an approach that is going to be bipartisan and have support across the political spectrum. And a really good example of that in Australia has been road trauma, where since the 1970s we've seen a bipartisan approach to very strong uh, policies around road trauma. And I might say uh, a fair bipartisan approach now to tackling COVID. Be prepared and be persistent. Sounds obvious, but critical. And very importantly for researchers, timing, be an opportunist. That window of opportunity isn't always there, but when it is, be there with your research and your evidence to have an influence. Understand when you communicate the power of value and, emo and emotions. Think about that. Don't just think about the evidence and think about the messenger, who is going to deliver the message and how it's going to be mess uh, communicated. And finally, prioritise and compromise. And having or anyone who wants to influence government really needs to have a compromise position that they can move to if they're going to be successful. So I've really tried to have a focus there on what researchers and experts can do to better influence government to use evidence. But finally, I think government and politicians have to change also. And I think it is reasonable for us as uh, behavioural people, people interested in behaviour, to think about applying the COMB model, capability, motivation and opportunity to politicians, just as they might apply it to the public. And so looking at capability, I think there is a role for training and education of politicians in the research method and in science. And that can be done through institutions like uh, the chief scientist. We're doing it uh, at Monash through an institute, the McKinnon Institute, which is actually providing professional development for politicians. And I think that should also include ministerial advisors, but also looking at motivation. Uh, and that can be uh, through modeling what successful politicians do, but it can also be through restrictions and rules and regulations. And an interesting one is in uh, the province of Ontario in Canada, where before a health submission is made to cabinet, the submission has to certify that they've undertaken a proper evidence review. And I also think a key motivator for politicians is the media. And so increasing the understanding within media, certainly with leading and elite journalists about the role of systematic reviews and good evidence will then help percolate down to and motivate politicians. And then opportunity, I think we can give an opportunity to politicians to access best evidence much better than they have now. I mean, there's no way politicians are going to be able to do a proper literature review or search peer uh, reviewed evidence, 60 million uh, research papers that have been produced through history. But there is an opportunity, I think, for accessible, relevant evidence to be provided uh, for politicians and the political process. And that's what we're trying to do through social systems evidence by having a database, a searchable database. Now, we don't even necessarily expect the politicians to access that and search it, but by providing rapid evidence reviews for ministers and politicians, we can use that database to provide evidence in a timely way. And that can be within a few hours or a few days, because that's very often what politicians need. And finally, I think there are some institutional approaches that are needed. And one is that cabinet requirement for an evidence review, as in Ontario, 
but I do think we need to look at all government processes and see are they adequately taking account of good expert evidence, peer-reviewed evidence, systematic reviews. And one example would be the Auditor General that, that in Australia carries out performance audits, but I don't think sufficiently systematically reports on evidence use by departments and government uh, projects. But beyond those uh, institutional approaches, I think we need to think of different ways of coming up with policy. And a really important one is transdisciplinary task forces. Uh, I was involved in the Victorian Cladding Task Force, which advised the Victorian government on how to solve the problem of combustible flammable cladding on the outside of buildings. And that task force had former politicians, the former premier and myself as former deputy premier from different political parties. We also had building experts involved. We also took on uh, academic expertise ev evidence. And so I think transdisciplinary task forces like that provide a way to bring evidence into a co-production of knowledge. Then royal commissions and inquiries increasingly being used. I think there is a role for issue specific institutions in Australia, like the Clean Energy Finance Corporation or the Transport Accident Commission. Parliamentary committees are an important way to have a bipartisan approach. And finally, what work centres, uh, which have uh, been much more prevalent in the UK, but hopefully we'll see more of them uh, in Australia as well. So that's the uh, total picture. And I guess the final uh, thing I'd say is that there's a lot to be done in improving the knowledge of politicians and the political process about good evidence, but also informing you as providers of evidence about the political process so you can have more influence. And to finish on a, a positive note, I think through COVID-19 in, in Australia, at least, we have seen much better utilisation of evidence. And I hope that we can uh, use that better approach as we tackle some of these more complex long-term problems that we face. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, John. That was, um, Twitter was going crazy. I've got a bunch of questions here. I will applaud you for walking through that so clearly and um, using quite a bit of heavy hitting scientists in your slides. Because I have the floor, I'm going to, I'm going to use the, I'm going to take the first question and then I have a bunch I'll, I'll read. And this may put you on the spot or maybe not, but one of the things that our work is about and this conference is about is bridging that gap between evidence and actually getting it implemented sustained and carried on. And um, there's a lot of questions pertaining to understanding of evidence, so I'll come back to that. But uh, more common um, outside of Australia and, and mainly in the Northern Hemisphere are the establishment of skilled groups of, you know, either an organisational teams who are charged with accelerating and bridging that gap between what the evidence says and what we do. And you mentioned systematic reviews before, which was terrific. Even the, some of the best written systematic reviews can be difficult for researchers to um, understand what is the upshot, what are the key messages. And I note your work with John Lavis at McMaster University. He's one of the best research translation people around, including Ruth Stewart, who's our new, who's our keynote right after. But what do you think is missing or what do you think is required in the system? And I, and I do mean policy and practice to help bridge that gap. Is it an infrastructure gap? So you discuss the um, what works centers. In the UK, that's an example of some infrastructure they created for the what works movement. And they themselves are starting to acknowledge we now need to really be focusing on getting that evidence implemented and improved on. What are some things you think need to be created or built on either in Australia or in your experience overseas that would help bridge that gap in sort of infrastructure or? I certainly think that the What Works Centres approach is really important. And what they do is that they are the next step really after systematic reviews where they can really translate that into more policy friendly um, products. Uh, because I agree with you, I'm, I don't think systematic reviews are policy friendly as, as they are. 
So I think there is a, ro a role for them. But the bigger thing is to change what happens in the mainstream policy making process. Like just setting up new what works centres or new institutions won't work if the politicians and the public service who are advising them don't adopt them. Hmm. So we really have to mainstream this into the public sector. And I think to do that, we've got a real communication uh, challenge now to convince the public sector and politicians that they're going to be better off and they're going to have better results, better outcomes and a happier public by doing this. And this is going to be a step-by-step -step approach. In uh, Victoria recently, our institute advised the Royal Commission on Mental Health on the use of systematic reviews and that was incorporated in their recommendations and that's a positive step and I just think we've got to do it step by step. I mean obviously in uh, Europe and the UK we're seeing the influence of Mariana Mazzucato and that mission driven approach which I think is a very good approach which is really taking over a lot of the policy processes and I think we could um, adopt more of that here in Australia. But you have to work in the mainstream, not just set up new institutes. Yeah, perfect. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to take it to the, the floor. I have one question here that's been getting quite a few thumbs up, so I feel compelled to read it. So, Melissa, this is for you. How do you think the educational background of politicians, e.g. law, humanities, etc., affects their perception of evidence? Uh, look, it does, and certainly uh, I'm a lawyer myself, so a legal perception of evidence is very much based on testimony, what people say and how credible they are. And uh, that is only one form of evidence, but I think it is a valid one to consider. I mean, it's interesting that governments are setting up royal commissions, certainly in Australia, to answer a lot of things, and that's the form of evidence that they largely rely on. And it's important to um, have other forms. So I think certainly lawyers think like that. Uh, different people come to the role with their background. So engineers, and there aren't as many engineers in government as there are lawyers, will have a different view. But also just the process of politics means that you move away from, uh, I guess, that more research-based evidence towards those heuristics I talked about and towards politics and emotion. And that's not all for bad reasons. That's for good reasons because that's the, that's the field of focus that we're in and so many people in the public are thinking like that. So it's a matter of having both those things. Yep. Terrific. If I can this answer, is... actually, one other thing I'd say is I think working with politicians to make them question their th process of thinking is important. So in the last 10 years since I left politics, I've been at Monash, I've been part of Behaviour Works. I've really questioned my thinking. Uh, and you know, people at Behaviour Works have challenged me and uh, I have changed my views about things. And now you know, I'm probably more aware of uh, some of these things like self-motivated uh, thinking than I was before. So I question myself more than I would have. And so I think, <laughs> part of our training for politicians should include that. Are you insinuating that you have some regrets, John, that you'd like to share? <laughs> I've got child. lots of regrets. I'm sure if I could yeah. do everything again, I'd do it better, <laughs> but we probably all would. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, implementation science, can tr trying it and continually getting better. So terrific. I've got one from Mary here that's related and it, it seems to be a bit of a theme around education um, coming out. Um, I recounted in my prior session that despite two graduate degrees in policy-related fields and plenty of undergrad coursework in public policy, the idea of evidence-informed policymaking was only something I came across after my formal education as a policy professional. What can we do to improve training and evidence translation, both pre-service and in-service, for policy professionals, and should we? Well, uh, we certainly should. And... Uh, you know, let's face it, this is something that's really only, I guess, been on the agenda, certainly to the degree it is in the last decade or so, and organisations like the Centre for Evidence and Implementation have played a key role in that, and hopefully we're playing a role at Monash through the Monash Sustainable Development Institute, but there are lots of other others as well. 
But I do think we've got to get in there and convince public service commissioners, for example, that this should be you know, very much part of the expectation for the public service. Uh, as I've said, think about other institutions within government, like the Auditor General. Uh, because once the Auditor General starts doing this, it's a bit like the tax man, uh, everyone will, will move. Or with media and the journalists, once uh, some of them... Now, I'm not expecting um, the, the sort of the daily rag sheets to think about evidence, but some of the uh, more considered journalists, I think, would. And uh, politicians do model their behaviour on other successful politicians. And if they can see some politicians doing this, then I think we'll get a greater uptake. And I think that applies to the public service as well. It's like that sort of herd. herd. What's, the, what's the concept when everyone starts following each other? We need to, we need to hashtag a little bit of that, create a movement. Um, Katrina's yeah. asking you something. Uh, so you mentioned earlier in your talk, John, around um, watch out for sort of things that are too hard or quite complex. So let me read her question. A lot of us are working on long-term complex issues, mental health, health care, service equity. That's come up a lot over the day, John, equality and equity and the use of evidence and implementation. And you've mentioned often that these can be put in the too hard basket by politicians. She wants to know how do we overcome this or do we just give up trying to influence policy in these spaces? You're sounding a bit tired, Katrina, so I suggest either a coffee or a drink, depending on what your time zone is. Let's not give up, but John, tell us, what are we gonna do? I think this is a case for issue-specific institutions. Uh, so an institution that has a targeted focus around the complex issue. Uh, now, I, I referred earlier to road trauma, and. You know, now we take for granted um, the incredible achievement there. But over 30 years, it's been an incredible achievement of something that 30 years ago was regarded as a complex problem. Mm -hmm. And the establishment of organisations like the Transport Accident Commission in Victoria and other similar organisations with a dedicated focus on road safety, I think makes a big difference for a few reasons. One, because you can get experts involved. Two, it goes beyond uh, one political cycle. And three, it goes beyond pa um, party politics. So because it's an institution, if you can get support from um, both sides over time, it doesn't just change at the next election. And another example in Australia is the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, which was tackling the really complex, difficult issue of how you get investment into renewables and energy efficiency and climate action. And by having a specialist institution that runs uh, beyond the term of one government, we've achieved that. And interestingly, that was opposed by uh, the Liberal Party. It was introduced by Labor, opposed by the Liberal Party, but now they seem to support it because it's had success and it's had a lifespan. So I think that's you know one, one key way to do it. The other thing I think we need to do is set targets for our country or our state that are midterm targets that we can agree on in a bipartisan way. And that's why I'm a big fan of the Sustainable Development Goals because they have been agreed by all governments, they've been agreed across parties, and they set a principle of setting a target to 2030, just 10 years hence. So it's sufficiently in the future that it's the long-term problems, but it's not so far that it means you don't have to do anything. So. I'd give those two answers. One, issue-specific institutions. Two, targets and the SDGs. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think this is going to be our final question and it relates again. You made a point. I did love your Ten Commandments, I have to say. I, um, if I was uh, able to get on my phone and start tweeting, I would have been doing that. It's related to one of your Ten Commandments and that is collaborate as a team. And I might also... Um, just put in the word sort of power there, who has the power. So I'm going to read, this is from Bianca. Could you comment on the inherent dilemma for researchers that emerge from collaborating with policymakers? Contributing to evidence-informed policymaking with quality information versus seeing your own work, that is research findings, being misused by politicians. And in fact, in some of the experience you would have and we would have ignored totally by um, how do we tackle that dilemma? Can it be tackled or should researchers just take the risk? Well, I think the answer is it's up to the researcher what, and what their objective is. 
Uh, if the researcher has an objective simply to do the best research and not to, um, you know, get their hands dirty in the political process and potentially have their research ignored or misused, then uh, that the researcher won't do that. But if you want to have an influence or an impact, if research is to do that, then you have to uh, take the risk and join the political process, just as a politician does. I mean, by entering politics, it's a big risk you take. Um, you know, look at all the politicians who end up with their lives, you know, being, uh, you know, frankly ruined and you lose an election. I can tell you it's a pretty um, harsh uh, awakening. But people do it because of the opportunity to have impact. So I, I don't think researchers should be under any uh, misconception, though, that by entering the political process, they are entering an area where it's not just about evidence. It is a fight and a, and a conflict between different values and interests. But they have a chance to change things, and that's a great thing to be able to do. Let me ask you one question, and you'll have to answer this so quick, and this is just because of the week we've had in Australian politics. What do you think if there was a majority of female politicians? You think we'd have so much conflict and <laughs> I'm, I'm setting that up a little bit. Well, I think already you've seen in where there are women, uh, the behaviour has improved and there is less traditional blokiness. So I think that's a very good reason for saying there should be 50 50, just as there should be a diversity of other groups coming into, um, into Parliament. Because we know from you know, all uh, evidence, good evidence, that uh, diversity means a better outcome and better decision that's much more sympathetic to the actual makeup of the community. So, yeah, I, I would agree with that. Terrific. I'm, I'm a bit worried. I'm hoping they haven't cut us off, John, because those numbers stopped. But... Um... That, yeah, I'm getting the no here. So we're still live, which is great. Terrific answer. And thank you for taking that last little point. Um, thank you so much, Professor Thwaites. That was an hour of that went super quick, which is a good sign at the end of a, a day one of a conference. And I do appreciate and we're grateful for you agreeing to keynote with us. Um, uh, I think you can, if you do, if you are on Twitter, John, there's a lot of great questions and comments that have been coming up. If you want to just hop on and look at the hashtag. But again, grateful for your uh, time. And if you want to hang around, in 15 minutes, our next uh, keynote starts, Dr. Ruth Stewart. She is from um, South Africa. She, you are almost a team, the combination of the two of you. And I encourage you to listen to her. Thanks, Fantastic. John. Fantastic. Thank you. Bye.